Hearts of the Shadow uh, Hearts <coughs> soundtrack actually might work for this too. Isn't that the game that's based on like um, uh, Bach or Chopin? I think it's Chopin. I don't know what those are. So the composer. Oh, Johann Sebastian Bach. He wrote pipe organ music. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with Shadowhearts, though. No, I think there's like a composer that's like a major character in Shadowhearts. Composer? No, there's a, there's a famous alchemist. This game is all about us looking up JRPGs now. Eternal Sonata is what I'm thinking of. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's the same thing as Shadow Hearts. No, <laughs> it's actually exactly opposite. Shadow Hearts is what it's called in America. <laughs> <laughs> Shadow, what is this? Shadow Hearts, developed by Sacknoth. Look at this box art. That is amazing. Everyone, please, thank you for joining us on the JRPG. Uh, Please admire the PS2 box art for Shadow Hearts with me. <clears throat> Lobos, what are you eating? Tacos. That's great. That's vanished. I love that. Almost. I've done that thing again where I have the cameras on the opposite sides of the screen. <laughs> but we're just going to stick with it. Cool. I think everyone knows who Feely Field is. Mm -hmm. I am going to adjust this camera just a tiny little bit. Here we go. Ready? Ready? We're going to adjust. We're... Wait. I don't have... Wait. Yes, I do. Wait, would you put... I have a mouse. I'm really good at streaming, guys. I have to put OBS. There we go. Now. Good. 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 Great. There. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That one's good. And yeah. Then, yeah. That one's even better. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. It's good. Oh my goodness. Welcome, we're playing uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, a game where we play a gang of um, would-be investigators working parallel to Sherlock Holmes himself in an attempt to solve an all-new original mystery written in the style of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's original harrowing tales. As with last week, we will be presented with a brand new mystery, and then we will take it in turns as a group to figure out where we should go, which leads we should follow up with, and who done it. I'm happy to say that once again we are faced with a murder mystery of some kind. This week's mystery is the Tin Soldier. It takes place. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not handing you anything. Hmm. After all, can I really trust you? Mm. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No one can be trusted. Everyone's a suspect. <laughs> I'm gonna eat my chips like this. Please eat your chips That's and good. listen. That's gross. <clears throat> welcome, welcome to a very special ASMR <laughs> mystery session of social eating and mystery board games. If you're not aroused, then please leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now that we're all flaccid, please listen. <laughs> Case 2, The Tin Soldier, 11th of June, 1888. We, that is we, the investigators, the Baker Street Irregulars, are gathered at 221 Baker Street. And we hear a clamor in the street below, followed by the ringing of the front doorbell and the sound of heavy footfalls on the stairs. It seems as if our moment of triumph is to be but short-lived. Come in, Lestrade. Lestrade, police inspector, timidly peeks in, his face betraying surprise at being recognized before he is seen. Really, Holmes, exclaims Watson. I suppose you will tell us that Lestrade rings doorbells in a most distinctive way, and that you would recognize his footsteps anywhere. No, my dear Watson, not at all, Holmes chuckles. But since the trip from the front door to ours was made in seconds, it was unaccompanied by a warning screech from Mrs. Hudson, it must be presumed that she knew the caller. Who else would be in such a hurry and gain immediate entry but Inspector Lestrade with some pressing and professional matter? Besides, while at the window Shut a few up. moments ago, I glimpsed the inspector's carriage turning onto Baker Street. <laughs> Inspector, now that you have regained your breath, how can we be of service to you? Lestrade plops down in a chair and gasps out, 
General Farnsworth Armstead, one of the six surviving Waterloo Tontite ticket holders, has been murdered! Waterloo Tontite, asks Watson. A lottery of sorts. In 1815, the Tontite was set up to aid the veterans of the Battle of Waterloo, Wellington's victory over Napoleon. For a pound, one bought a ticket in the name of some young relative. Longevity is paramount to winning. The ticket proceeds amounted to over a million pounds, half of which went immediately to veterans and their families for medical and hardship expenses. The remainder went into an account at the Bank of England, where it has been collecting interest all these years. The sole surviving ticket holder will claim that prize. A king's ransom, certainly, exclaims Watson. Who are the surviving ticket holders? This is a list, and so for your benefit, I have written it out for you already. Nice. Here's the guy that was killed. Indeed. You can tell it because there's a skull <laughs> there's a next skull. to his name. The oldest is Captain Robert Jurgens, 82. Then Anita and Claire Thomas, twins, 80 years old. William Rowland, age 79. Peter Dudley, 77. General Armstead was the youngest at 74. The Times is sponsoring some big to-do involving the Tontite survivors on the 18th, says Holmes. That's right, a Waterloo anniversary banquet at the Langham Hotel. Why is the name Armstead familiar? Perhaps, Watson, you are thinking of the General's book, Treasures of the Conquerors, says Holmes. He was a noted art collector, I believe. Indeed he was, Mr. Holmes, says Lestrade. He was interested in valuables which at one time belonged to famous military men. The book traced the history of various objects and how they passed from collector to collector. Quite a sensation it was, if you know what I mean. At the time of his death, he was working on a revised edition for his publisher, Norgate & Company. It was to contain an entirely new chapter on a fabulous diamond called the Polar Star, which at one time belonged to Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother. The general had new information that traced the gem to its present owner. What do you think, Holmes? I think, Inspector, you should tell us the circumstances of the general's death. Ah, uh, mm. Uh, at 10 o'clock this morning, the General's valet and former Batman, David Sennett, admitted a caller to the General's study. The caller was an elderly gentleman with a French accent unknown to Sennett. It was all very unusual in that the General never sees anyone in the morning while he was at work. But the gentleman insisted that if the General would read a letter, he would be the exception to that proven rule. And so it was, Sennett took the letter to the General, who went very pale indeed when he read it. He told Senate to let the man in, sensing, sensing something amiss. Senate dwaddled in the area of the study for the next 15 minutes or so. Suddenly, he heard the distinct sound of sword play. He then tried to enter the study, found the door securely locked. As he attempted to force it, he heard the crash of breaking glass. He gave it up and raced to the kitchen out the back door to enter the study from the garden. The caller had quite vanished by the time he arrived and the general was leaning against a display case of military miniatures, the shattered top of which accounts for the broken glass. Before Senate could assist him, he dropped a rapier from his hand and fell over dead. I take it, asks Holmes, that the letter that so upset the general was nowhere to be found. Correct, Mr. Holmes. Well, Inspector, we shall put our brains and feet to the task. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Huh. The case is afoot. <clears throat> mm. Can I see that? Of course. So we can, of course, consult that in any leads that we've already followed up with freely throughout the night as we try to figure out who done it. Who done it? He killed a man. Former Batman. Former Batman. <laughs> I have no idea. It's what... definitely Batman, not Hatman. No. So no. I can understand Hat Man. So 10 a.m. 10 a.m. <laughs> Batman, a term used in the British Armed Forces for an officer's personal assistant. Hmm. The term is derived from the obsolete word bat, meaning pack cell. David Sennett. Admitted caller. Oh, so the banquet hadn't happened yet. No, it's on the 18th. It's now the 11th. Perhaps there's word of it in today's newspaper. Surely. Maybe. Mm, an elderly gentleman. French accent. Indeed. Hmm. 
So immediate concerns, I think, um, would be probably speaking to the coroner to find out a little bit more about the state of the body and whether or not he was indeed stabbed or something else caused his death. Um, crime scene, of course. Crime scene makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> ah, the 73rd Waterloo anniversary. It is indeed in here. The Times is pleased to announce a dinner on the occasion of the 73rd anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, Wednesday, June 18th, at the Langham Hotel. Surviving participants in the Waterloo, Waterloo Tontine will be guests of honor. Further information is available at the Langham Hotel or the Times office. There you are. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, who's starting us off uh, the investigation meeting? Why don't you? Fair enough. Why is, yes. Uh, why is... Uh, okay, anyway. Typos or whatever. No. There are a couple. Capital B, broken glass. Yes. Like, but Is it a clue? <laughs> no, it's probably a typo. They had to translate it from uh, whatever they speak in England. So he was killed at his residence, right? Was okay. he killed at his residence or an office? Yes. he was. Admi- well, was... he was admitted to his study. Yes, I believe it was his office in his house. Okay, so... He was a general, after all. He would probably have an office in his house. Yeah, well, let's... I do. Go pay his sure. visit. Or rather, his, uh, former so, place of residence. No. Mm. Not alive anymore. General Farsworth Armstead. Indeed. Lives at 27 Northwest. 27 Northwest! Probably a good place for a marker marker, too. Yes. I have, um... I'll set that up as soon as I finish reading. Games again. Okay. <clears throat> so one curious thing. Indeed. It almost sounds like perhaps they had a proper duel because there was sword play. Well, Unless he was just like, oh, and then had something. That's sort of why I wanted to talk to the coroner, as a matter of fact, because it sounded like sword play, but... We didn't actually see, have visual confirmation of his sword play. Sure. So I'd like to know if he was stabbed to death or whether in fact he died of something else. Sure. Where are we now? That's a great question. Um, 27 Northwest is uh, the residence of the, uh, General Farnsworth Yes. Armstead. Let me uh, read out what we discover there and then I'll place a marker. Okay. 27 Northwest. My god, there's a lot of text. That's fine. I did some breathing exercises <laughs> back in 7th <laughs> grade. Nice. At the Armstead home, we find that the police have cordoned off the premises. It is only after mentioning Inspector Lestrade's name in a loud and indignant tone that we are able to gain admittance. We pass into a large foyer which houses some of the General's art collection. On one pedestal is an alabaster uh, alabaster vase. A card states that it once belonged to Alexander the Great, given to him in tribute by an Egyptian prince. In a glass enclosed niche is a jade necklace once owned by Augustus Caesar's wife Livia. In all, there seem to be fif- there are some fifteen objects in the foyer, none of which appear to have been disturbed. At the study door, we are met by the general's valet and former Batman, David Sennett. We judge him to be the general's contemporary, that is, in his seventies, more by his white hair and weathered face than by any deterioration of his physique. He is, in fact, slim and athletically built. One has no problem imagining that his uniform of 40 years ago still fits him perfectly. Ramrod stiff, only his eyes betray any emotion, and they are quite red as if from weeping. He readily agrees to conduct us on a tour of the premises. The study is a very large room, devoid of furniture, save for the desk at the opposite end of the room. To our right, between two bookcases, is a glass-enclosed display, the top of which has been shattered. In the glass case is a diorama of some 200 military figurines. Hanging on the wall above are flags, sabers, a hussar's pelisse, and other military uh, equipage. I think a police is like a pole arm of some kind, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, the general called this his Waterloo Wall, explained Senate. These are the mementos of that great battle, and of course, the Tontite ticket. The ticket, a large certificate really, is framed and hanging at about eye level among the other paraphernalia. This is where I... Excuse me, it's Batman. This is where I found the general, <laughs> says Senate, leaning over the diorama. He must have smashed the glass with the pommel of his rapier. Oh my god. What does this diorama represent? It is a depiction of the last great British charge which swept the French from the field at Waterloo. The Iron Duke, as the Duke of Wellington was called, is waving his hat to signal the advance. 
Here now. Then it points to the figure represent, <clears throat> representing Wellington. While all the other figures are advancing towards the viewer, the figure of Wellington is turned around in the opposite direction, that is to say, facing the wall. How strange, says Senate. He is about to set it right when we caution him that nothing in the room should be turned until the, uh, touched until the uh, police investigation is completed. On the wall opposite the Waterloo wall are hung two crossed cav cavalry pennants. Above them, some ten feet above the wall, up the wall, excuse me, is a single rapier. There is a dust pattern on the wall which crosses it, indicating a missing twin. It was the rapier that the general had, explains Senate. A chair, normally placed by the desk for the use of visitors, has been moved against the wall under the rapier. Faint footprints soil the fabric of the seat. Several handwritten pages, which represented the revisions of the book Treasures of the Conquerors, are strewn on the top of the general's desk. Senate tells us that the general was working on it when the visitor arrived. These particular pages deal with the history of the gem, the polar star. It traces the ownership from Napoleon's brother to a Russian, Count Rostov, who acquired it in the year 1872 and from whom it was stolen in 1887. Next to the manuscript is a letter from Pierre Matin. It simply states that he is prepared to divulge the name of the present owner of the gem, the agreed-upon fee. Information and money are to be traded at the Bridge House Hotel at 10 a.m. on the 12th. Also of interest is a notation in the General's appointment book for the day of the murder, 1 p.m. French Embassy. The General was to meet with an old friend, Jean-Paul Gerard, says Senate. <laughs> Me, uh, Gerard, was an instructor at the Comitari when the General was sent to France in 48. Are you with the General in France? Oh, yes. I've been with the general almost 45 years. Finally, there is a small framed photograph of a stern-looking woman. That's the late Mrs. Armistead, says Senate. We detect a note of hostility in Senate's tone and inquire about it. Well, sir, you might say that Mrs. Armistead and I never quite got on. You might say that Mrs. Armistead did not get on with anyone, including the general. Theirs was not a love match. No, sir. Lord Fitch was in danger of having a spinster daughter on his hands. And the general, well, sir, he saw it as a way to, of social and career advancement. It was an arrangement, nothing more. God. Uh, <laughs> Ethel asks, is this a telltale yeah. Batman game? Yes. Yes, that'll be $35. <laughs> Uh, but surely something between them must have developed. Why else would the general keep her picture on his desk? Actually, it was placed there to tweak Mrs. Armstead's brother, the present Lord Fitch. You see, a good deal of Mrs. Armstead's wealth, and so the general's, was in stock in various companies. Her brother also holds stock in those companies. Whether they liked it or not, and believe me, they did not, Lord Fitch and the governor were in business together. Lord Fitch was to see the general this morning, but he never arrived. Normally, the picture resides in the lower left-hand drawer. Going back to this morning, would you describe the collar for us? It was a short old man. He wore a black cape. And he carried a carpet bag. Oh, and he walked with a cane. It's literally the penguin. <laughs> it was just the penguin. We know it. We, oh, my yeah. gosh. Call Inspector Gordon. We have the case solved. Done. He didn't give a name? No. He simply asked to see the general and presented a letter which he intimidated that the general would want to see. And you didn't see the contents of the letter? No. But the envelope was yellowed with age and it was addressed with a very graceful hand to Captain Armstead, 12th Hussars, the general's old regiment. When he read it, he went very pale. Then, in a subdued voice, he asked me to admit the gentleman. When you finally got into the room, though, these gar through these garden doors, the study door was still locked, correct? Yes, that's right. Uh, the garden is surrounded by an eight-foot wall. The only way into or out of the garden is through the house, correct? Yes, either through the kitchen door or through these doors. We thank him and leave. A couple of translations from Batman used to English. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Yeah, what you got? Uh, the brother that is reluctantly in business with him is second. Lord Fitch. Just Lord Fitch. Okay. Yes. F I T C H Fitch. Okay. Uh, is that John something? Gerard. Ger oh yes, that is the Gerard. His old friend Jean Paul Gerard. G E R A D E. Okay. An instructor at the uh, class, I guess, or not the like the military academy. And he was meeting him the day he was murdered at the French Embassy. Uh, he was supposed... Wait, no. Fitch was the one that was supposed to arrive, but didn't. He was supposed yeah. to go... Fitch meet. was the next day. Today, rather. Or rather, the 12th. There were two meetings he missed that he missed because he's murdered, or he's going to miss, right? Yes, was he was supposed to meet him that day at 1 p.m. Okay. And then John was supposed to meet him... John was supposed to arrive at his house that morning, but never arrived. Wait, I thought that was Fitch. Wait, excuse me, that was Fitch. Oh, yeah, there's three people. Jean is the one that he was supposed to go see at 1 p.m. And that was at the French Embassy. Yes. Okay, and then who was the guy on the 12th, his name? Uh, the third uh, person he was going to meet. And didn't God meet. damn. Pierre Matin? I think yeah. you're right, yeah, yes. Oh, yes. And he was also supposed to meet him. Uh, yes, and who was Pierre Matin? Uh, the guy who had information about the diamond he was willing yes, to sell. Yes, he was supposed to be selling him the information about the diamond. So Lord Fitch never arrived. He didn't. Which is interesting. He didn't like him. He didn't like him, but they were in business together, and presumably this was about that. Uh, I can't imagine them arranging a meeting that wasn't about business if they didn't like each other. Sure. So why didn't he arrive? <clears throat> And then, of course, there's the two people about the diamond, which, you know, this whole funny lottery business is interesting and nice and all, but... I don't know, the diamond itself could be, easily be a motive for, a Absolutely. For murder as well. I'm not convinced on one either yet, but they're both <clears throat> worth looking at. So, my first thoughts, at least, about the letter that you want in general to look at, mm -hmm. potentially some sort of... Interesting information on an artifact or something like that. Of well, remember it was addressed. It was. It looked old, and it was addressed to Captain Armstead. So it looked as though I think something oh. that was written long ago, because right now he's a general. Right. And has been for a that while. Makes sense. So I think that this is maybe some information from this man's past mm. that he didn't know about. There is a Captain Robert Jerkins uh, among the uh, other mm. lottery folks. Hmm. What was? I mean, lots of people can serve in the military and not necessarily know each other well, though. Of course. Hmm. There's also an age difference of eight years, but that may not mean anything. No. <clears throat> yeah, I think there's some on to something with the Captain General thing, so. Yeah. Um, oh, so there's hmm. another detail here that I thought was interesting. Let me, uh, it's 27 Northwest. Yep. Would you place that for me? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 so... He was found with a rapier in his hand. Six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, so I'm going to reread the paragraph uh, here. On the wall opposite the Waterloo wall are two are hung two crossed cavalry pennants, which are like big flags. Mm -hmm. Above them, some ten feet up the wall is a single rapier. There is a dust pattern on the wall which crosses it, indicating a missing twin, which is the one that he had. A chair normally placed by the desk for the use of visitors has been moved against the wall under the rapier. Faint footprints soil the fabric of the seat. Now that suggests that if someone showed up and wanted to kill him, then they had ample opportunity to do it while he was fetching whatever this the rapier, because he would have had to have gotten up from where he was, he which wasn't he was presumably. The if there were footprints on the chair, it had to be someone from outside, right? I mean, if you're just sitting in your study all day, would you leave visible footprints? Ah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking it might have been planted on him. Hmm. But I don't know. But he was I holding think. it before he collapsed. Like, he was still alive when he was that's discovered. True. That's uh, true. Just barely. So, yes. Okay, fake hmm. footprints soil the fabric of the seat. Mind, hmm. we live in an era of uh, <laughs> London where there were no such things as sidewalks. So if someone was walking through the street, they'd get dirt and mud on their feet anyway. 
Well, sure, but I mean, the captain, this was his home, it was in the morning, he probably hadn't been outside all day. That is a very good point. So mm -hmm. it probably wasn't the captain that climbed I'm on the chair. I'm sorry. No, excuse me, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Captain. We're already falling backwards through time. <laughs> We're moving through time at the speed of regular time. Okay, so someone else, presumably the visitor... Is... what's the name of the victim? Farnsworth, Farnsworth Armstead. Armstead. Alright. Who's Wellington? Wellington is the name of the general that defeated Napoleon at right. the Bottle of Waterloo. Why was that misplaced? The soldier, yeah. That is an interesting question. Um... It... I don't know. But... Is... Wait, are you talking about the thing that was turned around? Or? Yeah, so oh. he has like this miniatures diorama, and Wellington in particular is turned around. Mm -hmm. I was um, like, listening to that, I was like, there's something going to be amiss about the broken display case, but it was it, and that was the only thing they really gave us. So yeah. Maybe that's um, just more Glass and closed, the top has been shattered, inside mm -hmm. is diorama, um, and Wellington has been turned, well, maybe not has been turned around, but was found turned around. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm not... Well, that could just be some sort of... I don't know. Some some sort of link to the, the Polar Star gem that he's looking well, for. Well, so... Even... even uh, I guess what I'm getting at is now I'm even more curious about the state of the body. Because how he died and whether or not he was in like a scuffle or something like that before he was in what apparently sounded like a duel... Um, if that was the case, like, because this, this whole notion of, like, someone pushing a chair over to the side of the wall and climbing it, whoever it was, in order to get the sword, if they were, if it was an attempted murder, then clearly there would, a fight would have broken out at that point, because the general wouldn't have stood for that, right? He would have knocked him off the chair, which leads me to think that, okay, he was letting him get the sword... Or something, which meant that they were just going to properly duel, which sort of makes me think that there was some unfinished business with them from years and years and years ago, or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the, the 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 whole fetching the sword thing, I think, is just sticking in my head for some reason. Um, mm. They have the description of the man who came to the door. Yes, Can old short again? French accent king, <laughs> and. A carpet bag. Carpet bag. Yes. The cane is an interesting one. I mean, it's an old trick even back this far, probably, to have a sword cane. Ah. Uh -huh. explain why there's only it, one sword in the That sword. would absolutely uh, explain it. And there was sword play, so we know there were two swords involved. What is a carpet bag? A carpet bag is like a suitcase. So but different. So, <laughs> potentially, it could be... It could have been part of the same military unit or whatever that he was assigned to? Maybe so. The Hussars. The 12th. But a French accent? In the British military? Well, no. Remember, he went uh, to the uh, the academy in France. Oh, um, okay. In 48. Fair enough. Hmm. Hmm. 1848, mind. Well... What do we think is most <laughs> squeaky linking carpet bag? Thank you, squeaky. <laughs> Large purse, kinda. The Duke of Wellington's birthplace. What? Mm. To the editor of the Times. Sir, I have today deposited at the military exhibition in Chelsea a most valuable piece of evidence to the birthplace of the great Duke of Wellington. The Simpsons paper of 1851, the first line written by his own hand. In it, he states he was born in Ireland, he believes at Abbey. This document was given to me and my sister as a great treasure by our friend Major G. Brown, the late Register General. I trust that it will end all controversy on this matter. Faithfully yours, C.G. Palmer, 33 Portman Square, Northwest. I guess it's in here because of the anniversary. It didn't seem relevant hmm. necessarily, but... It... Maybe there was a article in a previous edition that uh, seemed to leave... Uh, the Duke's birthplace in question. Hmm. Uh, well, we could go in chronological order and start with 
seeing if we can find Lord Fitch, who was supposed to meet him that morning. Cert certainly suspicious that he just didn't show up and didn't send word or anything that he wasn't going to show up. Sure. That's so. I do think that visiting the coroner's office would also be a fair point. I definitely would like to know how he died for certain. Um, with the figures in the case being yes. as they are, I wonder if the broken glass was even caused by the fatal blow or was something he did afterwards. Yeah, I don't know. Um, or Let's even something the assailant did. Let's go to the coroner. The coroner is on the back of the... No, it's on the back of the... Uh, oh, book. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> coroner. That is Sir Jasper Meeks of 38 East Central. Yeah, it kind of sounds like he was still dying and like maybe broke open the case and sure. turned the dude. Yeah, you know? There's, lo there's lots of different explanations for yeah. that, I think. Yeah. Sir Meeks is in the middle of an autopsy when you arrive in the room. I'm sorry, Wiggins. I'll only have a bit of time for you. Sir Jasper informs us that the general was killed with a sword thrust through the heart. It was an upward thrust. Hmm. That's upward it? Thrust. That was it. <laughs> Uh, Fieldier, so you can track Harley. Stabbed while he was grabbing the rapier. Oh! I was gonna say, we, but then, what was the sound of swordplay that we heard? But well, the old dude was short. Yeah, was, yeah, he was short. Mm. He was. Does that kind of sense? It would seem to me like we would have found like blood on the wall. I don't know. Could he have made it all the way from the rapier on the chair over to the display case if he was stabbed through the heart, though? Oh, that's a very good point. I don't, for that matter, I'm not convinced he would have time to meaningfully fiddle with anything in the display case either. I mean, can I see the uh, hmm. yeah that the thing that you yeah? yeah. Uh, I'll double check the address. It was 38 EC. I'm actually just going straight back to where we were. Oh, okay. I'm just skimming for. Did we hear about blood splatters anywhere? I don't think I don't so. I don't remember hearing anything about blood. I mean, Should granted. <laughs> Maybe not a splatter, maybe just on him. But... Just any kind of blood whatsoever, you know? Hmm. <clears throat> huh. That was 38? Very, very, very little to say. Oh, I completely forgot to mention that Brandon was out this week. Yes, I'm sorry. No, Brandon is perfectly fine. He is just out of town. Shucks. Try hard not to look at things. <laughs> hmm. Sword thrust through the heart. It was an upward thrust. Well. Hmm. Well. I didn't even say, like, well, I guess if it went all the way through, they could still be able to tell which side it came through, right? Maybe, I don't know. It would or be with useful. a rapier, it would just be like... I'm going to guess that because he didn't mention it, that it was from the front. Yeah. Um, if anything, I think that that will simply affirm that whoever our short visitor was, was probably the murderer and not someone else. Yeah. <clears throat> which... Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Mm. Well, is this... I, her? I was going to say, I think that... I think it is this guy's past that we need to, to chase. Because... I can agree with that. An old guy mm. delivering a very old letter. Yeah. Arriving with a sword to kill him? And a French accent, no less. That's we antiquated. And we we have a very, we have a French a French accent likely possessing connection to his past. We do indeed. The person of the fellow he was going to meet at the embassy. Yes. That seems like a. So we can go to the guy's home, or we can go to the embassy. <laughs> was it Pierre? Yes, Pierre Matin. Uh, no, that's the guy he's meeting about the diamond for the lead. The guy from his past is Jean Paul Gerard. <laughs> yeah, whatever oh. it was, or something, something like that. <laughs> and that he was meeting that fellow at the French embassy. We um, love you, uh, yes. If he was going to meet the guy at the embassy at one, maybe we should go to the embassy. What was his connection? Is it depends on what time uh, it is. I think he was like an instructor at the in, in his, from his military days or something like that. Well, something was, like that, yes. Hmm. Definitely a connection to his military past, which seems very relevant to 
what we've discerned so far. Indeed. Um, I would, I would guess the embassy. Yeah, that's where he was going to meet the guy. Yeah, good enough for him, good enough for us, hopefully. And it's still like noon, GMT. <laughs> <laughs> whatever time we want it to be. What no, it's whatever time the book wants it to yeah. be. Unfortunately. What do you think, Louis? Are we gonna do the French Embassy? Yeah, it's fine. Fifty-nine Southwest. <laughs> That's all that's fit. Oh man. Not it's the one that says French Embassy. Yeah, not a long walk from the general's <laughs> residence. Indeed. Probably a quite How a scenic. How do you spell his last name? My, my it's uh, G E R A D E. Gerard, not Gerard, but Gerard. Oh. Oh, wait, are we going to the embassy or his place? No, I'm. Oh, I'm just looking up. Yeah, right. All right. A sprightly, silver-haired gentleman meets us in the embassy waiting room and Sephiroth. introduces himself as. Jean Paul Gerard. He leads us to a small office where we can have our conversation in privacy. Monsieur, we begin. You knew General Armstead from his tour of duty at the Ecole Militaire, did you not? Yes, the general. He was but a captain at the time, was one of a group of mm -hmm. English officers sent to our war college. We in turn sent a number of French officers to your war college in Sanders. I was assigned to be the general's guide, as it were, during his stay. We were quartered together and were constantly in each other's company for an entire year. In such a situation, people emerge as either the worst of enemies or the best of friends. Happily, the latter was true in our case. Would you describe the general as he was at that time? The general was quite a dashing fellow. I would say that when on duty, there was no more dedicated officer in the English army. His knowledge of military history was astounding. But off duty, well, that was another matter entirely. He breaks into a broad grin. I'm afraid the general was quite a devotee of wine, women, and song, although not by any means in that order. I was quite amazed at, shall we say, his stamina. I, a Frenchman, could not keep up with him. When I complained that he was putting me and my countrymen to shame in matters of love, he laughed and said that it was because we did not have a horse base to spur us on. You see, just before the general left England, he had become engaged to a Mary Fitch, later Mrs. Armstead, rude. On her, he had, on her, he had conferred the unfortunate sober quick horse face. It was uh, <laughs> a marriage of convenience only. It would provide the general with social position and a significant increase in wealth. He looked on his stay in France as a last fling before the marriage knot was tied around his neck was the way he phrased it so there was no particular woman in the general's life at that time curiously there was someone although i never learned her name my little flower he called her i remember one morning actually it was the middle of the night near the end of his tour of duty when the general awakened me it was obvious that he had not been to bed and he was slightly inebriated he wanted me to rise and sorte with him out in the country. That means uh, ride off on an adventure. Cool. Um, I told him to get some sleep. Morning call was only an hour or so away. With my rebuff, he settled down on his bed and rambled on somewhat cryptically about promises that must be kept and promises that couldn't be. Finally, he slumped back on the bed and sighed. My little flower, I... Sh I'll never forget the depth of that sigh. Ma fleurette, he said. <laughs> Have you seen the general of ten over the years? No, not at all. In fact, our friendship has been entirely maintained by correspondence. Last week, when I arrived in London, we had supper at Rules, and then went to see the French actor Philip Arnaud. Perform. <laughs> the general commented that my presence next to him while French was being spoken from the stage reminded him of the old days. It was, in fact, the first time in almost 40 years that we had actually been in each other's presence. Your visit went well? Oh, exceedingly. The general was in excellent spirits. 
Was there anything in particular on his mind? Did he seem worried? No, not at all. He joked at length about the upcoming Tontine celebration at the Langbam. Alas, he even predicted that he would certainly outlast the other ticket holders and win. He was also very enthusiastic about the new information concerning the Polar Star. He was to meet someone this week, a countryman of mine, if I'm not mistaken, who was to give him that information. If anything, he was looking forward to that meeting. What business did his appointment with you this afternoon involve? The business of two old friends simply getting together to dine and chat. It is hard for me to believe that my good friend is gone. Hmm. Yeah. What was it? Uh, 59 Southwest. 59 Southwest. I am more convinced than ever that this is regarding particularly that event. I think that he was supposed to meet a lover who was more emotionally invested in what was going on, despaired at the fact that he did not arrive as he promised that he would, and then wilted away and that we're dealing with perhaps a vengeful brother or something like that. I could certainly go along with that idea. As with everything, it's an affair of the heart that's at the core of it. Every single one of these is just... It's just beautiful <laughs> and dead, <laughs> just like real life. Yeah. Uh, Forget during the opening. Uh, did it mention if uh, Miss Mrs. Fitch had been killed or was dead? She was dead. She was dead. She is departed. Yes. Well, then the only person left on our list who might know something about that other woman would be Lord Fitch. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. If he'd ever mentioned it to Mrs. Fitch, I'm sure she would have told her brother in probably no small amount of anger. Do you imagine that you would have shared that detail with her? He didn't like her very much. Perhaps in a moment of heated anger. That is so. Hmm. I'm sure perhaps she may have even found out on her own. I mean, he was doing all this stuff while apparently engaged to her. <laughs> yes, that's an excellent point. I was trying to figure out if maybe there was some clue regarding her uh, name or something like that that simply wasn't as mm -hmm. uh, his nice flower. mistress or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, even, was... but even if we knew her name, she probably doesn't live in London. <clears throat> no, I suppose not, but uh, yeah. Lots of flower names you could have. Horse space. <laughs> wow. That's so rude. Mm -hmm. Where's the deaths were? Let's see, George Pivot and his uh, 79th year. Uh, Tilda Latita, eldest daughter of the late Alfred Rawlinson. That doesn't sound French. I think that's Leticia. Leticia, yeah, Leticia. Uh, Matilda Leticia, that uh, doesn't sound French. Mm. Hmm. Mm. <clears throat> Of course, she died earlier. I think we should visit Lord Malcolm Finch. Fitch! Is he the only Fitch in there? He's the only Fitch in there. Well, he must be Lord Malcolm Finch then. He could, he could indeed. Actually, I was looking to see if anyone had the last name Florette. Oh! <laughs> There is a Gabrielle Fleur, but, um... Well, if it's not in there, it doesn't cost us a lead. Remember, if there's <laughs> ah, absolutely nothing, it that's costs so, us nothing. That's so. If we show up and the door doesn't even have, like, the interaction uh, <laughs> prompt. So, given that, it, given that it's either a freebie or a critical strike against the boss monster... It seems like it's worth trying. Yeah, I mean, we've just done so well with each of our leads so far, except for that one yeah. where we didn't. It was um, a it was a reasonable check. It was a very reasonable out. check, but it was another of my insistences. <laughs> um, I feel I feel really good about that attempt. Like I said, I mean, it's almost risk. I can't, it can't I can't believe that it would be there and be nothing. It's either not there and it's a wash. There's someone in here whose name is Clive Fittiment. It's me. It is. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> um, let's, if you guys are okay with it, let's indulge this curiosity. Okay. Check out 72 Southwest for me. 
72 Southwest, huh? Where is that on the map out of curiosity? Like, it's, okay, it's a little there. Bit. Okay. I was hoping it's something shaped like a flower. <laughs> <laughs> if only. No 72 Southwest. Blast! Well, it's free though. You get to pick another one. Let's go to Fitch's office. Okay. I guess. Okay. What was that? Uh, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um. Lord Malcolm Fitch lives at 39 Southwest. 39 Southwest. Okay. <clears throat> Must be the rich part of town. <laughs> I'll look over there. It's right here. All right. I admit to having had a strong dislike for Armstead, says Lord Fitch. He was a cad and a bounder who made my sister's life miserable. <laughs> I argued at length with my father against the marriage, but to no avail. Unfortunately, Mary was not the attractive sort who had suitors by the score. Far from it. She was in real danger, as my father put it, of advancing rapidly into spinsterhood unless he did something about it. And so their engagement was arranged just before Armstead was sent on a military mission to France. During that year, I continued to argue against the marriage. Uh, I had made several friends on my tour of the continent and I asked them to forward any information they might have on Armstead's unsavory activities. Yeah, she <clears throat> they regularly sent back word of his riotous living, his drinking and womanizing and such. Finally, there was some scandal or mile involving a young French girl of good family. But even with this documentation, my father would not dissolve the betrothal. I even went so far as to give the story to the newspapers, hoping to create an untenable situation for everyone involved. But my father got wind of it and used his influence to stop publication. You must understand, I considered that what uh, I'm I considered that whatever hurt uh what? Oh, I was okay. You must understand. I considered that whatever hurt I was doing my sister in the publishing of such a scandal was the lesser of evils in the long run. Indeed. At the time, I was sure the marriage was a mistake, and so it proved to be. May we ask why you did not keep your appointment with the general this morning? My wife took suddenly ill. I summoned Dr. Ein, uh, Ein, Einstree and waited until his arrival at around 10 o'clock. Thank you, Lord Fitch, for your time. I feel like the newspaper might be our next stop. There is, in fact, a particular paper that I believe is devoted to um, gossip right. of this sort. Ah. <clears throat> did he specify a paper? Or did, did I don't think that he did. Sent in the newspaper. I think he would probably. Uh, society communist. Yeah. Okay. Well, wait. This was a long time ago. Granted, but he would years probably ago. he would probably have access to the records, would he not? He would, or the Times themselves is what I was thinking for records, maybe. Unless there's a different, there's an archivist, uh, all legal and criminal now. So yeah, no, I think it's going to be It was never paper. published, so yeah, it's either going to be Lang Langdale <laughs> Pike or it's going to be the uh, newspaper. The Times. Yeah. I think, um, honestly, checking one and then the next is, I, I think we're hot on the trail, as it were. Oh, yes. <clears throat> um, probably I would lean towards the gossip columnist, given the, uh, the nature of this particular... Uh, Sure. Report. I'm more in favor of the Times, but I won't argue it too strenuously. We go to we go to Pike first. I think the Times would be more about the um, the event that they're holding coming up, right? Because they mentioned the Times. Yeah, they oh, that's there. a very good yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an excellent. It's point. not a branching. Like it is. Right. Like it is. What's what's the address? <laughs> uh, two Southwest. Two Southwest. <laughs> right so the much text. The border of Northwest, West Central, and south Southwest. It's like Risk. Southwest side story. <laughs> exactly. I'm a shark. We catch Langdale Pike in a quiet moment at the Society's Club. That is to say, there are no hangers-on when we enter. That being the case, Pike is more than happy to expound to us. <laughs> a good general married into a considerable fortune when he took Lord Fitch's finster daughter Mary off his hands. Mary's brother, the present Lord Fitch, was against the marriage from the beginning, and there is still considerable friction between him and the general. It's amusing to think that they are in business together. You see, Mary possessed many stocks in common with her brother. When she died, they all went to the general. Armstead and Lord Fitch were locked in each other's embrace in a business sense. Ah, the vagaries of life. 
The General's claims to fame were his own art collection, made possible by, Mary, by Mary's money, and his book, which exposed the public's eye various other art collectors, most of whom would rather not have been so exposed. His book caused quite a stir, let me tell you. Not all the collectors mentioned came by their booty by fair means. Carson Cabot, a gem collector of some note, once accosted Armstead because the book called into question the means that Cabot used to acquire a ruby. It was once owned by Catherine the Great. I wouldn't at all be surprised if Cabot had in his possession the Polar Star, the centerpiece of the General's revised edition. Getting back to the General's marriage, do you know why Malcolm Fitch was against it? I believe it had something to do with the General's reputation with the ladies. My understanding is that he was a bit wild in his younger days. Of course, that was many years ago, and I know none of the details. If you're interested, you might check with my illustrious predecessor, Lloyd Lloyd Shoemaker. Schumacher? Schumacher. 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 We thank Pike and take our leave. Hmm. Seems like we're still on the right track pretty strongly. We just need the previous version of Langdale Pike. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, let me look up where Lloyd Shoemaker is. Hopefully he's still alive. <laughs> well, that would be too bad. We went to his door. We can cast Speak with Dead at his grave. Oh, nice. <laughs> but even so, maybe he's, uh, his kids have his old records or something like that. Well, he's still in the directory. Yeah! Lloyd Shoemaker at 31 Southeast. Fieldy, what do you think about uh, following that up? That would be fun. <laughs> Let's do it. Right. 31 Southeast. There he is. Oh my god, he's so big, he's lording over all of London. Lloyd Shoemaker shows us his humble flat. It is evident that it has been a long time since he enjoyed an audience of any, any sort, and so he is quite pleased with our company. Langdale Pike told us you might be able to help us. At the mention of Pike's name, Shoemaker's thin lips tighten and his eyes take on a hard, hostile look. It is a minute reaction, but it is enough for us to infer that the transition from for, um, Shoemaker to Pike as Gossip Wander Extraordinaire was not a pleasant one, at least as so far as Shoemaker was concerned. Mm. And how is Langdale these days? He asks, his voice, his tone of voice clearly indicating a hope that our answer will contain some mood and news of terminal disease. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, he's fine, says Wiggins, to Shoemaker's profound and obvious disappointment. We wondered if you might search our memory and tell us a little bit about General Farnsworth Armstead and the circumstances of his marriage to Mary Finch. <laughs> I can do better than that. So saying, he opens the curtain to reveal a small cubicle, and it are stacked wooden boxes which contain papers, memorabilia, letters, and newspaper clippings. He rummages about a moment or two and comes out with a thick file. As he looks through it, scattering dust hither and yon, he speaks. As I remember it, Lord Fitch was in a dither to marry off his daughter, Auction off might be the more appropriate phrasing. <laughs> I don't really know how Captain Armstead needed the picture. Suffice it to say that despite a reputation as a uh, prolific of profound proportions, Armstead's career prospects were bright, and that seemed to be enough of a recommendation for Lord Fitch. The girl's brother was very much opposed to the match and did everything he could to break it up. Soon after the engagement was announced, Armstead went on a tour of duty in France. It was then that the brother uh, came to me with some information of an affair with a young French girl, as reported to him by friends on the continent. Ah, here it is. He shows us an old letter, letter addressed, to, addressed to Malcolm Fitch. As you can see, the letter contains nothing beyond the hints and rumors of scandal, no names. I made my own inquiries and found out that the French girl's family name was Arnaud, and further, the girl was pregnant. When I took this information to the pub papers, they refused to publish it. Evidently, Lord Fitch had been there before me. Thank you, Mr. Shumi. Isn't that the same last name as the actor? One, there's an, yes, uh, the person they went to go no. see. A-R-N-E-A-U. A-R-N-E-A-U? Yeah, there was an actor they went to go see. Yeah, um... After uh, reading uh, the rules. Right, after reading rules. rules. And, and then, then they, they went, went to go see a show. Yes. <clears throat> Huh. Indeed. Maybe we should pay a visit to the theater? Well, 
Save our nose in here. Know. Maybe staying at a hotel somewhere. Well, maybe. Let me, um, I'm gonna look back at Oops. the French embassy yeah. entry. He can in here, though. I bet he's not usually in London. Yeah, and simply right. took the opportunity to murder a man. He did have a traveling bag with him. <laughs> he did. As a traveling actor might have. Carpet bag. French for actor. That's not true. Um, indeed. Um, well, Last week when I arrived in London, we had supper rules. And then went to see the French actor Philip Arnaud perform. Yep. General commented that my presence next to him while French was being spoken from the stage reminded him from the old days. Uh, Why don't we go visit the stock exchange? Because they keep going on about this business that they were in together. They had shared stocks that they they could. Fitch's portion through his sister went to the general and he seems pissed about it. That's so. I'd be on board with that. I'm gonna look up. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where, if anywhere. Um, uh, but, but, but. There we go. Princess Theater, French play, sole manager, Mr. Eric Idler. 22nd season of French play is now underway. The entire company, 40 in number, of the company Arno, Paris. A French place, if I recall correctly. Appears at this theater in the two great successes of the year, Vivier de Empire and the French Fin de, de la Cille. Box office open daily from 10 to 5. And that's at where? Princess Theater. Princess Theater. Yes. Might be the special. Should, yes, it is. Uh, Princess Theater. If we want to go there, it is at 11 Northwest. I really think that maybe there's something to do with this. Mistress. This mistress and her connection to this family that uh, perhaps got jilted. I think that Fitch has reason to dislike the guy, but um, I don't he think that he murdered this him. Long. Why did he wait 40 years? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, granted, it's, the stock's being transferred is something, but his sister was chained to the dude for 40 years. Yeah. If he killed him, you know, 35 years ago, she would have had her life back. Besides, there's no guarantee that when he dies, they transfer back to Lord Fitch. That's mm-hmm. true, too. They made him... Um, Brandon, they don't sound like the type who had a son or daughter and there hasn't been one mentioned, but... Also, in meta context, the last mystery had to do with stocks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Surely they don't all have to do with the stock exchange. That would be terrible. <laughs> and they made it pretty oh, readily no. available that the stocks were just like where they were and not like... Kind right, of why he hadn't he just written rest them off for the rest sure. of <clears throat> um, such so and such. Are you going to the theater? Am I going to the theater? I think it's your turn to choose. Oh. Oh, we're still doing that. Yep. Well, we're just, you know, loosely. Just... <laughs> yeah, no, the theater's good. Okay, that is at 11 Northwest. And I'm ready? No. Nope, that is Fieldy's nope. turn to okay. read if it is your turn to choose. Mm-hmm. In the English tradition. I find it difficult to believe there's only four tea rooms in all of London, by the way. <laughs> 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 right, at least 40. <laughs> You say lots of info? Mm-hmm. Oh, good, good, good. We arrive at the Princess Theater where Vivi Le Emperor. Vivi Le Emperor. I don't know how to say these words. A biographical play on the life of Napoleon is being performed <laughs> by the French. Napoleon. <laughs> <We> are new. <laughs> The play has been a great success during its limited engagement in London, and there's a long line of people trying to obtain tickets for the last two performances before the company returns to France. We make our way backstage to meet the company manager, Jarvis Arnoux, the uncle of the leading actor and founder of the troupe, Philip Arnoux. He is a short, stout man in his mid-fifties, given to extravagant gestures to express a passionate personality. He is very proud of his nephew and fairly bubbles over in praise of his ability. Oh, but you must see Philip perform. He is a magician, a wonder. The breadth of his talent is truly magnifique. Magnifique. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to any viewers in France. <laughs> or Canada. Anywhere. Sorry, Carson. 
<laughs> he, he manages to portray the Emperor Napoleon from the age of 26 to his last days on the island of St. Helena. You would swear five different actors played a part, but no, it is only Philip aging before your eyes. As he speaks, he leads us down the corridor to Philip's dressing room. Of course, years of training and practice go into the making of such an artist. But at age 48, Philip is the toast of the continent. Monsieur Arnaud is 48 and you're his uncle. Ha ha, I am, but eight years older than Philip. But eight years older than Philip, but I assure you that I am his uncle. Yes. <laughs> is he lying about his age? It seems that the Arnaud family has a history of late arrivals. Philip's father was 23 years older than myself, and Philip's poor sister, he points to the daguerreotype of a young woman, was 11 years older than he. Next to the portrait of the sister is another of an older woman. Each has a black ribbon draped diagonally across its top right hand corner. Yes, they are both dead. The sister, many, many years ago, under very tragic circumstances. Philip's mother had to be put into an asylum. She just couldn't accept her daughter's death. We received word from the asylum only last week that she, too, had passed away. It upset Philip very much. Resurrected old ghosts, you might say. And his performance suffered. But he has recovered completely. I have never seen him more brilliant than he was last night. You must see him perform. You must! In fact, if you'll wait here, I will arrange for tickets. Can you tell us where Philip Arnaud was this morning? Monsieur Arnaud gives us a puzzled look, but answers. He was at the National Gallery, but why do you ask? Just then, two workmen carry a trunk into the dressing room. Monsieur Arnaud throws his hands in the air and exclaims, No, no, my sonnies. <laughs> that trunk should go to the company lodgings at the Grand Hotel. He turns back to us and shrugs, as if to say, what is one to do? Then he says, wait and I will get the tickets. During the entire interview, we have never stated our purpose. <laughs> Feeling somewhat guilty that we have obtained information under false pretenses, we decide that the better part of valor would be to leave before Monsieur Arnaud returns. And then I got, I got the Grand Hotel. What was the other place where the thing had come, where the gear had come, was supposed to be? Um, the National Gallery. The National Gallery. No, that's where Wait, he was this morning. You're right. I'm oh, sorry. that's where he was. The, del the trunk that was delivered was supposed to go to the Grand Hotel. That trunk should go to the lodgings of the Grand okay. Hotel. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, well, you see, well, this is our suspect, and he, he supposedly has an alibi. We should probably check the alibi. Well, no, he said the event resurrected ghosts. Clearly, it was a ghost. It's undead. Yeah, <laughs> it was a vampire. Dracula. Hmm. Good game. Um, can I see the newspaper? Absolutely. Oh, it's okay. under Herbie. <laughs> I feel like the hotel might have been mentioned there, or the gallery, maybe, but I didn't read it in great detail. <clears throat> I mean, I all this, I'm, I'm like 99% certain it was him. But I do want to check his alibi. He supposedly has one. Sure. I don't want to just throw it away, because I tell you, I'll certainly throw a, a, a kitten in the hamster cage <laughs> if it uh, turns out he was there. <laughs> that would be embarrassing. <laughs> that would be very bad for all, for all concerned, except for him. <laughs> But I mean, especially for us. <laughs> oh, yes, for us. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of Sherlock Holmes. That would be like, that would end my career. Well, the only thing that'd be more I don't even work here. That would be more embarrassing than that than than finding it out this way would be finding it out during our uh, supposed attempt to solve the case. So. Do you know what I uh, really like about this is the idea that you can play this with any number of people each of whom presumably represents another of the Baker Street Irregulars. Mm -hmm. But then you've got a troop of like five or six people, like literally an adventuring party, just cornering people in Victoria and London and going, excuse me, sir, <laughs> what can you tell us about these events? Like that's like a, a shakedown. That's a gang arriving at your, your doorstep. I, I think checking at the gallery would make sense. I think both the hotel and the gallery oh, yeah, they, would be we'll, we'll, reasonable leads. The hotel might even be where we find him himself and get something out of him, perhaps. If he's still alive. 
<laughs> Maybe the ghost got him, too. Does <laughs> anything? I'm good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would take a glass of water. Okay, ice? Uh, yes, please. Actually, I changed something. Can I have ice water, too, please? <laughs> thank you. Hello. You do it? Hmm. <laughs> and the question is, like, he can play different ages and roles, but is he short? Because I, I feel like that would be hard. He to plays Napoleon. Play. He has to be short. Oh, does he? Yeah. Oh. I did say that he was short. Yeah, Napoleon. Or maybe it's that his uncle was short. Well, he, in the family. His, his uncle was short. Even if it didn't say he was short, if he plays Napoleon, he can't be, <laughs> be some tall dude. <laughs> but his uncle was short, and he probably also was Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. There's Also, he's French. They're generally short. <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Wait, so... Hmm. Would that be the dead guy's bastard son? Or No, it's the younger brother who would have been a small child at the time that his sister was jilted and then died, probably killed herself. Which she he was able to deal with, except that very recently his mother, who went crazy, died last week. And then he probably saw the dude at the freaking play. That's right. He probably <laughs> saw him and went, just, just look at him. A having a much. good time, remember. Yes. Having a great time. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoying life. A happy, yeah. happy guy. At this point, yeah. I think we simply need to confirm that he Didn't wasn't have, somewhere yeah. else yeah. at the yeah. exact yeah. moment of the crime. Unless he's capable of transubstantiation. <laughs> like, Are there any other details like that we might need to wrangle for like well, remember, there's bonus. a second set of questions, but those are for bonus. That's true. How many leads have we followed so far? Seven. Seven. That's probably That's including like one four, or two. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> We're going to get dinged on the sword one, probably, but other than that... Maybe. Probably got away with... Most, most of these will probably be ones Holmes checked himself, because I feel like all sure. of them, almost all they of them are necessary them. leaps from one to another. Indeed. Grand Hotel. Oh, wait, the alibi is the gallery. I'm sorry, yeah, the gallery. That's right. <clears throat> Grand Hotel is the lodgings, but I don't... We may not even need that one. Yeah, I don't think we necessarily have... There's no guarantee that it'll be there anyway. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Um, it's a shot in the dark. Gallery might be one of the back ones. Gallery? Is it just called gallery? The National uh, Gallery. The National Gallery. What is that? Art gallery, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Even oh, today, sometimes museums lend stuff to movie sets and whatnot, so I can see it being an art museum lending something to apply. The National Gallery, Gallery in London. Indeed. Oh, it's still there. He can go visit London just today. It's a real place. The National Gallery, but I guess that shouldn't be much more surprising. It might just be under N. I'm surprised it's not one of the big oh, categories. Oh, it might actually be in. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Remember, we, we hit that with the, right. the Admiralty? Yeah. The Admiralty. <laughs> yeah. Hey, for Admiralty. Yes, it is. National Gallery 24WC. WC. Is, I think it's yes. your turn. Yes. My turn? Yes. <clears throat> Was it 24WC? Yes. Right there. 24. Also, not very far away from anything. 24WC. 24 WC. As we arrive in front of the National Gallery, we're struck by the majesty emanating from oh, the building. Majesty. <laughs> oh. The large columns topped by the dome and facing Trafalgar Square's fountain are truly a spectacle which can attract visitors. And indeed, the museum seems quite packed today. Despite our searching, not a single keeper can remember anything specific about a French visitor. Fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that just no. means he wasn't there, possibly. <laughs> oh, certainly right. No one, certainly yeah. no one saw That's him. That's right. We didn't want that. <laughs> a famous actor visits a museum and no one remembers. Precisely. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. Right. That's the result we wanted. So. Do we want to solve it? So then we think he. 
Yeah. So the guy was him. It was him. Or the note could have been something from <clears throat> the lady. The letter. Oh, that's almost certainly what it was. A love letter from his sister to him. That or, has to be. Or maybe it like was. a final said, letter well, where before his, she killed herself. Yes. Or something. Was his friend Jerry Jerry or whatever? He said that they regularly corresponded by letter and Weren't his letters intercepted by the brother to give proof to the newspaper? I don't know if they were intercepted. He had buddies over there who were like spying uh, yes. on him and reporting back. That's what that was. I don't know if it, I don't know if it went as far. I as think this. that that was probably a suicide note left by yes. a sister. That was simply uh, never delivered to him because they were like, "I'm not giving." And this he disguised fucking. himself as an old man, <clears throat> delivered that letter, and then arrived and went, "Look, ha! I'm 48," <laughs> <laughs> or something. Yeah. What about okay. the sword play? Any? Probably, no, I think, no, I think this is exactly what it was, where he was like, I am going to kill you like a gentleman. Oh, so And then he shoved it over, climbed up, grabbed a sword, shoved it in his hand, and said, fight me. <laughs> and honestly, if he was if he was maintaining his old man disguise, maybe, if the guy didn't know his true age, he might have thought he had a chance, when in fact he was fighting someone 30 years his junior. Maybe, I think... Like yeah, yeah. Although I, I kind of agree with your first statement. He probably would have revealed himself. Absolutely. Because he wanted the full... Like Mission Impossible. <laughs> I guess he could have claimed to be her... No, he couldn't claim to be her father. He's not going. He wouldn't be old enough. Why bother yeah, claiming? Why not, I think yeah. this is his moment. This is... Yeah. I'm killing you because you killed my sister and my mom. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I think. I think we should solve it. Because I think we've got it. I think cool. so too. Alright. <laughs> Are you going to read the questions? Sure. Okay. And you guys can, uh, I will scribble down our answers. Yeah. <clears throat> still review anything we want to review that we've looked at. We just can't look at anything new. Um, oh, you mean even after the questions are asked? I would presume so. As long as it's nothing new. Right. You look up anything, I would assume, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Questions for part one. Who killed General Armstead? Philip Arno. Question two. Why was he murdered? Revenge for the death of Philip's sister and mother. Revenge. Okay. Three. Uh oh. Why was the Duke of Wellington's figure turned backwards? Sir. I might have a decent guess on this one. <laughs> Maybe something to indicate. Napoleon. Uh, well. Hmm. Who was Wellington again? Do you think he dressed up as, as the general, the little miniature of the general that defeated Napoleon? Do you think he was dressed in the same thing that, or at least similar stuff that he does this Napoleon act in? So maybe he, I don't know. <clears throat> or just to represent So in an attempt to try and show people who did it, they're yeah. like, I don't know. This is scary because this is in part one. It's probably 25 points we need this It one. probably is. Um, Let's think about it. I think that it, regardless of who did it, it represented Armstead's shame and like falseness of character. It's... But there's an obvious connection with the French too, because I mean it was a battle against the French and he turned the figure of the leading charge, winning charge, facing ah, away yes. from... Yes, and he himself is playing the character of Napoleon at the theater. So, I think this is perhaps... You think Arnaud did it? I think so, yes. I think Philip turned it around as part of his revenge of France fighting back against England. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, I'm just going to write down Napoleon to represent that. I'm not going to write down all those words. <laughs> We have a video archive. <laughs> Everyone can hold me, hold me accountable. Uh, question four. Oh man, the name of the adventure is the Tin Soldier. Probably the figure is made of tin. <laughs> I think we're doomed. But we oh back. no! <laughs> question four. Um, with what what kind of weapon was the general assassinated? His cane sword. His cane sword. Okay. <laughs> that part's not why I think we're doomed. Part two is where we're going to have. Part two is only bonus points. It is, but anyway. Well, so part two, at least in the first adventure, was entirely like Some things were accessory completely. stuff. Yeah. We, we focused in pretty <sighs> deliberately see, on the door matter. Who killed Pierre and Andre Matin? 
Ooh. They're dead? No, Pierre Matin is the guy that uh, was he supposed was to sell him the stuff. Ah. Yeah. It's hmm. on the info. Oh, Cabot. I know. Cabot. C- uh, Cabot. Cabot, yeah. Cabot did that. Yeah, Cabot. The... Uh, the um, oh, he wasn't happy with how the the other art were collector acquired who didn't want to be exposed. And he was likely the possessor of the polar diamond or whatever. It was. Exactly, polar okay. star. Second question. North Pole. Mm. Yes. Why was Marshal Gullifoyle late to work? Excuse me. Marshal Marshal Gullifoyle. Let's ignore the name and look for something to do with work with work. Gullifoyle. Maybe. Um, yeah, that's the first time we've ever heard that name. You read that side of the newspaper, I'll read this side. <laughs> carriage accident. Yeah, there's a carriage accident, so it might be that. <clears throat> The gentleman who so courageously stopped Lady Sloan's horses in Curzon Street on Saturday afternoon and would be greatly obliged to let me know their names. So, uh, oh, can you see? Well, who's, whose name was it? Uh, We've never heard his name before. I know. Marshall Goliofoyle. G U I L F O Y L E. G U I L? Uh, G U I L. He's at 26 North West. Mm. It's too late to look him up. No, no, no. I was trying to, trying to check location. Yeah, Never see if he can, would. You can still do that. So that's not near him, but. And we have no idea where he works, so. Have we been any better leads than carriage accident? This sure. is this Curious. is last one, right? It is, yeah. yeah. Last three months think, ago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not late because of that. What was he? Yeah. Yeah. This is all like foreign affairs. That's the thing that. Best I mean, guess. Yeah. Like carriage accident. <laughs> Curzon Street. Yeah. Traffic. He may have been the one who stopped Mrs. Sloan's horses. Mm-hmm. Ready for question three? As ready as I'll ever be. Yeah. <laughs> who has the polar star? Um, Carson Abbott or Cabot. Cabot. Yeah. I feel nervous that he's the answer for two <laughs> questions. I suspect only one of those well, would turn out to be right, but that's fair. That's yeah. You know, One's better than nothing. <clears throat> and here's another one that's probably... Or the uh, person who That will get him. right. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Maybe it's the guy that killed him. Maybe it was <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. To whom are the letters sent by Andre Matin destined? Uh, Andre? Oh. I don't even know who Andre is, unfortunately. <laughs> Pierre's brother? Dad? Dad? Oh. Dad brother? Um... Uh. Just put cabin again. <laughs> sure, yeah. <why> not? <laughs> it's a destined, not addressed. No, wait. That's. Yeah. I don't know. What was the question? Uh, to whom <laughs> were the letters sent by An- Andre Matan? Matan de- uh, destined. Matin. Matin destined. To his son Pierre. <laughs> oh, that makes more sense than Cabot. I'm going to mm-hmm. cry if it's Cabot. <laughs> right, that's the only one that's Cabot and the other two. I know, right? Uh, All right, Pierre, like Pierre or Cabot. What are you talking about a disaster? We've totally solved it. <laughs> I'm scared we might not have, but we'll see. I'm almost positive. We absolutely have the murderer. What else matters? Mm-hmm. We'll see. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to rub Sherlock Holmes' big Roman nose <laughs> directly into the fire. Uh, Is number four Pierre or Cabot? Pierre. Shall I begin? Sure. Alright. Oh boy. Well, we're all here to Sherlock knocks your notebooks out of your hands. <laughs> ah, you fools! You're fired. <laughs> I killed him. We don't even <laughs> God damn it. Okay. Well, we're all here and waiting. For the life of me, I cannot imagine how you kept to the truth of this case. Holmes puts wits aside the morning paper and begins. In this particular case, which might be titled The Case of the Tin Soldier, if you'll forgive my intrusion into your literary follow up Watson, the most intriguing fact was the method of the murder. The distinct sound of swordplay reported Mr. Sennett, most odd, suggested to me an affair of honor. At General Arston's home, my suspicions were confirmed. First, the letter, yellowed with age and addressed to the general by a rank he held some forty years ago. It upset the general, indicating it concerned some long past indiscretion. It was the reason for the duel. 
How can you be so sure it was a duel? asked Watson. The general had time to place a chair against the wall, climb upon it, and retrieve a rapier hanging ten feet above. The murderer allowed him to arm himself. A duel is the only event that fits with the facts. It is also interesting to note that the second rapier remained in place. The intruder came prepared, but the sword came. As to the intruder himself, the Senate described him as an old man, yet he left the premises over an eight-foot garden wall, a disguise, and carried off with enough of expertise to completely fool Senate. The carpet bag was used as a receptacle of the disguise when it was no longer needed. Then there was the clue left by the general himself. Mortally wounded, incapable of speech, mm -hmm. at least incapable of producing a sound that would carry through the study door of the Senate, the general wanted to leave some clue. With his last bouts of strength, he smashed the diorama glass and turned the figure of Wellington in the opposite direction. The diorama depicted the Battle of Waterloo, says Watson. I would have thought that the Tun team was involved. If that was so, Watson, the general need not have been so indirect. The Tunton ticket was hanging in front of him. All he had to do was reach for it and the message would have been clear. Based upon an indiscretion out of the past, a letter addressed to Captain Armstead, the jet rank the general held at the time of his service in France, and the intruder's French accent as described by Senate, I concluded that an interview with John Paul Gerard at the French Embassy might prove probable. The picture provided by Mr. Gerard fit directly into the pattern. Having agreed to a marriage of convenience as a sacrifice for his career, the general lived a riotous life in France. A full carefree life without responsibility for exactly one year. A rather romantic notion. And what is more romantic than a desperate and ill-fated love affair? Mr. Gerard's mention of the actor, Philippe Arnaud, struck a chord. Who better than an actor, a trained master of illusion, to disguise himself and perform in that disguise convincingly? Also, Philippe Arnaud performs the role of Napoleon. According to Mr. Gerard, the general had seen the play and gone backstage to meet Arnaud. Oops. <laughs> well... You fucking dunce. <laughs> You're dead. When the general turned the figure of Wellington around, he was trying to tell us that his killer was Napoleon. Wellington's opposite of the Battle of Waterloo, or rather, the actor playing Napoleon, Philip Arnaud. At the Princess Theatre, seeing the two portraits and hearing something of the women's story suggested a reasonable scenario to fit the situation. Arnaud's sister was the Little Flower, a proper name, not a description by the way, sighed over by the general to Gerard. She was an impressionable 17-year-old who fell madly in love with the dashing English captain. When the captain jeer came to an end, she despaired and took her own life. Her grief-stricken mother went mad and was sent to an asylum. Thus, in the twinkling of an eye, Philip Arnaud had lost a beloved system and sister and a loving mother. He was but six or seven years of age, and while he desperately felt the double wound, he was too yet less too young to understand the circumstances that caused him. Some forty-two years later, he stumbled upon a letter written by his long-dead sister yielded an explanation and a name, Armstead. He came to London and fate engulfed him. He received word of his mother's death, and at the same time, the London papers trumpeted the hated Armstead name. Armed with sword stick and letter, he went to the general's home to take his revenge. Oh. Well. So the exact Feeling pretty smart. <laughs> the exact answers. Yes. We're a little off on some of them. Not at all. We were 100% correct. He killed Jar General Armstead. Philip Arnaud. Yeah! Oh, actually 30. 30? Yes. Hell yeah. Why was he murdered? Because he disgraced Arnaud's sister, Florette, some 40 years previous. Yeah. 30 points. Yeah. Why was the Duke of Wellington's figure turned backwards? The general turned it around to point out that his killer was the one who opposed Wellington at Waterloo, Napoleon. In this <laughs> case, the actor who was playing the role of Napoleon, Philip Arnaud. 30 points. Yeah! With what kind of weapon was the general assassinated? <gasps> a sword cane. Ten points. Uh, I put cane sword. Oh man, crossed off. Fuck uh, me. Wait, what did you say? Ten points? Ten points. Put negative uh, ten hundred points. Because you I'll put, put cane sword. <laughs> Actually, we might have done really well here. I know! Oh, that's what I was saying! Hold on, hold on. Who killed Philip, uh, Pierre and André Matin? Cabot. Cabot. Ten points. Cabot. <laughs> Why I put Cabot? Why was Martian, uh, Marshall, Martian, <laughs> Marshall Gullifoyle late to work? Woo, woo, woo. He stopped off at Roland and Fraser's to buy his wife an anniversary gift. Yeah, we didn't get that. Oh. I don't even know what an anniversary is. <laughs> I'm 10. Who has the polar star? Carson Cabot. Yeah! Points. Yeah! To whom are the letters by Andre, uh, Andre Matan destined? The one from Brick Street is for General Armstead. Oh. The one from Pont Street for Carson Cabot. 10 points. Mm -hmm. 
Five? No, we didn't. Oh, we put okay. Pierre. Oh, we put. Oh, we put Pierre. Oh no. <laughs> that wasn't a good. We game. got so many points. Okay. Okay. What are our free leads? So here, here's how the leads stand. You can cross these leads off of our list. Okay. Uh, General Armstead's residence, so the crime scene. The French Embassy. The Princess Theater. And the Grand Hotel, which I don't think we actually yeah. need to. So we got three, four, five leads then. Then our total score is their total there, minus 25. Oh wait, 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 no. We probably more leads at home, so I forgot that part. So he had four leads. Oh, one more. We only had one extra. Oh wow, three, four, five, yeah. So we have one extra? One extra. So minus five on our score there. Wow. <laughs> okay. 120? 115? I think that's 115. 115. If we're really counting, so the third one, I wrote down Napoleon because we had the spirit of the thing correct. I don't think we ever deliberately said who turned the thing around. I think that we thought we said that it was the killer and not... We didn't write down either. I thought we it didn't, was... I, 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 I had we, said that it was him, and but then... We, we didn't come to a consensus on who it was that actually sure. turned it around. We just sure. said why it was turned around. Yes. Sure. I'm counting it. <laughs> okay. I'm willing to count it if only because I'm pretty sure there was nothing in any of these clue books that ever would have spelled out who turned it around. Yeah, and who do, how do we know that Sherlock is right about that? No, there is something <laughs> very deliberate about it where he said that if it had to do with something else... Well, if it had to do with the lottery, he would have just pulled yeah. on the lottery ticket, but there was nothing that said the general did that as opposed to, say, the killer doing it as some kind of thing. Sure. I'm willing to count it. Re all right. <laughs> then by... Democracy, we win. <laughs> we all vote that we win. <laughs> 115 points is our final total. Yes. Holy crap. And of course, Sherlock Holmes always gets 100, so we actually beat him by 15. We did. <laughs> Take that. Literally. Rip. Rip. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't destroy Sherlock Holmes. We have eight more mysteries. He just disappears. Is he a space, space though? That's, him, that's then... him. He's so big. Oh my god, he's dead. Oh, yeah, he'll he's probably come back. Stupid smiley face. Oh, that works too. <laughs> you know what we should do is we should just put like Fieldy's face there instead. Please <laughs> do. <laughs> I have so many good selfies. You it's so from. good. All right, good. We'll do that from now on then. Wow! Holy crap! We totally solved the mystery and we did we a did. great job. We did. Good game. Good game. GG. Wow. Go us for not falling for the at least two the gym, red herrings yeah. they flew out. They threw at us right away. They flew yeah. red flying herrings just left and right. Hey, um, the slaughter. Hey, the diamond. I mean, um, I hate to say it, but given the evidence, it looks like Brandon's holding us back. <laughs> <laughs> Despite solving the mystery last time. Right. Right. He was so good. He was so many steps No, over. that's absolutely not the case. We, we miss Brandon and we can't wait to have him back for next week's adventure. <laughs> I was worried um, today. I was like, shit. I was also worried I was because like, what if we don't solve it because he's gone and be so embarrassing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess we'll wait till next week to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no, but we did super good. Oh Actually, my goodness. I disagree with Sherlock about the footprints on the chair. I feel like <laughs> that the killer should have been the one getting that. Well, I mean the dude. I mean the dude works in his house. He never left the house that morning. He has a manservant to do things like pick up the paper and stuff. He didn't go outside. So. No. Sure, I'll get wrong. I got, we got more points than him anyway. Well, he didn't say that it was like a dirty footprint. It might have just been like a foot impression or something. If it was like oh, a Oh, yeah. I Maybe it was an fair. imprint in the dust or something like that. Maybe that's what it was. That's fair. That's fair. If it was like that, sure. But I mean, like a bloody footprint. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of these people was outside. And honestly, for a duel, either explanation could work. He could hit the thing himself, or his visitor could have. Although his visitor was short. I probably, if I were doing it, I probably would have pulled out my sword and said, get that sword down from the wall, rather than, like, turn my back on him. Yeah. Because then he could have mm -hmm. just run away or well, yelled for help well, or I'm something. Actually, I'm, actually, I'm actually with Holmes on this one now. The guy was short. There was no way he could reach ten feet up on a wall. He what if he had chair, two so. chairs? <laughs> <laughs> Even with a chair, I don't think he could have reached it. So that is fair. That's a very good point. Well, shorty. good work. We rocked that one. We did upsettingly well. <laughs> um, I wonder if this is like, I don't know, I don't know. Now I'm this worried. isn't. Now I'm worried the next salt. week. It's uh, not a pure <laughs> assault, but maybe next week's will be. I don't know. <laughs>
What if next week's comes with like a secret box like Pandemic Legacy <laughs> that I just didn't notice before? Uh oh. And then we open it and it literally just has the victim died playing Imperial Assault. Oh, oh no. And then we never stream again. <laughs> Okay, good game. Good game. Thank you guys so much for playing. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. Mm -hmm. That was a ton of fun. I love this game. It's mm -hmm. super great. Um, if you're interested in playing this game, please stop watching. Don't <laughs> play it. I mean, do play it. Don't watch it. Get it yourself. It's wonderful. And But if you are enjoying hanging out with us, then we certainly appreciate uh, you doing so. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be back next week with more Sherlock Holmes. We'll take tackle whatever the third case is. And we'll be back next Tuesday with more Dungeons & Dragons. Which, believe it or not, is not finished forever. <laughs> they didn't all die to the dragon. Yeah, sure. Someone's going to wake up, probably. <laughs> what if like, we fade in on Tuesday and it's just like a completely different group of players <laughs> just sitting here? And it's like, meanwhile, on the other side of the continent... <laughs> no one's ever written anything about the other side of the continent. <laughs> I think you mean planet. Oh, planet. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I hope you all have a good night. Thank you again. Good night. Take care. Bye.